So I realized I need to get caught up with my Stormlight reviews. I've talked about Oathbringer a lot. I've made a video about theories after Oathbringer, which by the way, I feel like I nailed it on the head with a couple of those. If you've already read Rhythm of War, then you should go back and watch that video. Anyway, I never did make a review or a discussion video for Oathbringer, so that's what this is going to be. The first half of this video is all going to be spoiler free as long as you've read up to Words of Radiance, and then I'll put a big spoiler disclaimer and I'll, I'll go into a spoiler discussion for Oathbringer. And of course, all of this is leading up to me finally reviewing Rhythm of War, uh, which, which I'll be reviewing next week. I find that each book in the Stormlight Archive is so hard to review, I think because they're just mammoth books. But let's start off with the presentation. First of all, Oathbringer is a gorgeous book. The cover wrap for this one has a map of Roshar on the inside, and we also have some beautiful full-color end papers that are showcasing four of the heralds. And of course, like the books before it, it's littered with artwork throughout. It's 1,248 pages. With each new Stormlight book, I'm always impressed with just the overall quality of the presentation, and how the weight of it also makes it double as a weapon. Oathbringer picks up right after the devastating ending of Words of Radiance. The Everstorm now circles around Roshar, bringing with it the spren of Crimson Lightning, which are waking up the docile Parshman. And as they awaken, the Knight's Radiant must once again speak the ancient oaths and work to defend humanity from Odium. Dalinar Kolin has now moved his army into the mythical city of Urethiru. He's bonded to the Stormfather and is trying to make peace and unite a world that knew him only as a tyrant. Now this is definitely Dalinar's book. We get his flashbacks this time, and wow, his character arc, both past and present, just hit me right in the feels. It's the reason why Oathbringer is my favorite, even though I feel like Words of Radiance is the better paced, better structured, and just overall better book, technically speaking, but Dalinar's story just makes me like this one a little bit more. Which is not to say this book is a masterpiece, because it isn't. Uh, there's a few things here and there that kept it from being as great as it could have been, uh, which which I'll get into. Next we have Kaladin Stormblessed, everybody's favorite sad boy. He's now empowered from speaking his oaths at the end of the last book, and is on a mission to race home to see his parents and hopefully find out more about the awakened Parshendi. Kaladin has obviously struggled a lot with his self-worth throughout the series, but I think here is where he's finally starting to realize that he belongs, and that sometimes it's worth it to take a chance. Then there's Shallan, who's continuing to grow in her Lightweaver powers, and is struggling to keep a grip on reality after admitting her terrible truth to herself. I'm always surprised at how many people don't like Shallan. I guess because of her pun-filled humor and her dad jokes, but honestly, I kind of enjoy how awkward of a character she is. She's one of my favorites, even if I am worried for her. Brando Sando effectively balances the book on these three characters, giving them their own conflicts and their own motivations, and sharing some mutual ones as well. Now obviously if you've read a Stormlight book, these aren't the only characters, there is actually 25 point of views in this book, but these are kind of the main three. And I'll talk more about some of the other characters once I get into the spoiler discussion. But let me just say, I was so overly happy to see Bridge 4 make more of a return when they just felt kind of absent from the second book. The loyalty and the camaraderie of Bridge 4 is always going to be one of my favorite things about the Stormlight Archive. Now, Oathbringer is very much a book about change, and this doesn't just apply to the characters who are all experiencing a lot of growth, but also to the world of Roshar. During this time of war, established hierarchies are being torn down. Cultural and socio-political lines are disappearing, while xenophobia and nationalism are growing. Society on Roshar is changing and evolving more than ever in this book, and I'd say it's one of Sanderson's most political and philosophical books to date, though it doesn't feel like like he's outright throwing these messages in your face. What I'm getting at is that one of Oathbringer's major strengths is that it shows you a world that's changed a lot from the first book. Roshar is known to be filled with slavery, strict gender roles, and a huge wealth divide between the Light Eyes and the Dark Eyes, not to mention magical storms that brutally traverse the land. While much of society on Roshar is still trying to cling to these familiar things, it's also breaking down walls and making way for new ways of thinking 
and coexisting. Light eyes and dark eyes are mixing, and a lot of the social order is crumbling apart. This world is constantly changing, which I just think makes it feel so alive. This book felt larger in scope than the previous two, and easily has the best climax of all three. Sanderson always does an amazing job at building up tension leading up to the end, which is what we call the Sanderlanch. The secondary characters feel more fleshed out, and there's a lot more revelations and twists. However, I do have my complaints about Oathbringer. While I loved the flashbacks for the most part, some of it just felt overwritten, like Sanderson was using pages and pages to say the same thing, and this actually doesn't just apply to the flashbacks. I feel like there's much that could have been trimmed down in editing, which is a complaint I also have with the next book, which you'll hear about in my upcoming review. Sando also has a tendency to hold your hand sometimes. He'll often repeat things that we already know, though I guess if you are making your way through the book slowly, then it could be a helpful reminder, but if you're binging it, then it just kind of feels like a lot of extra words. The pacing is another thing I'm kind of mixed on. There's some awesome, fast-paced, dramatic scenes and, like, intense political intrigue, but then there's also large segments that just kind of drag on where a lot of stuff happens, but not a lot of significant stuff happens. Happens. And I think part four is the, is the guilty one that a lot of fans talk about, where it just feels like it really drags on. I did enjoy this part of the book, we got a lot of new depth to the world, but at the cost of slowing things down. But obviously a book of this length is not going to be perfectly paced, these are just kind of minor complaints, but it's something worth mentioning. I also found that there was too many side stories going on in this one, and it just kind of pulled the plot in, in too many different directions. Overall, I'd say that Oathbringer is pretty much everything thing I expected. It makes good on the promises of the first two volumes, and it elevates the Stormlight Archive to new heights of incredible world building, epic magic and action, and characters that continue to grow. Now it's time to move on to the spoiler section. So, uh, so leave if you, if you haven't read Oathbringer yet. I, I'm gonna take this time to just, to thank my patrons for making all these videos possible. You guys are amazing, and I love, and I love you. Okay, it's spoiler time. I don't even know where to start with this one. Uh, it has been a while since I read this book. First of all, I was really expecting someone, especially Kaladin, to, to get like full living shard plate in this book. And we did get some kind of suggestions, some kind of hints at people getting shard plate, but no one actually, no one actually gets real shard plate, so that was kind of surprising. Now, I guess I'm just gonna go character by character, so let's talk about Dalinar, since this is his book. Uh, first of all, he, I feel like he has, like, the most dramatic character arc in this entire series, and this is the book that basically cements him as one of my favorite characters of all time. A lot of the mystery about his past is resolved. We get to learn how horrible of a person Dalinar was. He was a warlord. He committed war crimes and is overall just a, a very terrible person. Sando Brando does not hold the punches on showing you this. Honestly, he was worse than Amaram, and he wasn't even a good husband or a father. Poor, poor Evie, I think that's how you say her name, Evie. Uh, she was such a good character, I love how she was constantly sticking up for, for Renarin and trying to get Dalinar to pay more attention to Renarin. But then, when Dalinar discovers that he killed his wife, he doesn't just have this immediate redemption where he wants to change. No, instead he, he spirals down into this deep depression and just becoming this drunken wretch of a person. It drives him to want to forget the things that he did, and when he gets that opportunity, he takes it. And yeah, he does become a better person, but then once the memories start flooding back to him, he he realizes he just buried who he was. Uh, then he, again, becomes, he spirals down into this big mess of a drunken person, and I just think it's handled so well. Like, it's not, Sanderson is not forcing this redemption upon the reader. You, you get to decide if you think he's worthy of redemption or not, and Dalinar himself hates himself. He hates the things that he's done. And I think because he views himself as such a monster, that's why he's redeemable in, in my eyes. Because obviously he's filled with regret and is taking acknowledgement of the things he did. Now this makes me skip ahead to the end when Odium is, you know, trying to get Dalinar to give him his pain, and he gives that super powerful line. He refuses to give Odium his pain. And I think this is the ultimate act of Dalinar taking ownership and no longer wanting to hide what he's done. And next 
next we need Shalon to do that. <laughs> That's one of those incredible scenes that just gives you goosebumps. I feel like Sanderson is really good at doing that, especially in the Stormlight Archive. And it's not like he's forgiving himself. No, he's, he's self-aware that he's a horrible person, but he no longer wants to bury that part of himself. He hates himself for it, but he doesn't want to bury it. And I just really like that this isn't your typical redemption arc. I love redemption arcs, but this one is just really unique to me. Uh, and that's, that's why Dalinar is one of my favorite characters. Also, on a side note, Odium is such a good, unsettling villain in this book. Like, he's not all powerful, but he's got to do a lot of manipulating. And speaking of the final battle, this is when we get to see just how much of a tank Yasna is. She is such a badass. I really, I think she's probably one of the most powerful Radiants out there right now. And I really just want Yasna to get more page time. And then there's Renarin, who like bonds a spren that's been corrupted by one of the unmade. And I, I love all the scenes with Renarin. I feel like he became a lot more interesting in this book. But I just can't wait for his character to come more onto the stage, because he's still just kind of a background character. Uh, let's talk about Bridge 4 for a moment. First of all, uh, Drehi and Scar, they they end up being so amazing. I love when they follow Kaladin and Adolin and Shallan to Kolinar, and they end up rescuing Elokar's son. It was kind of glossed over, but they are so badass, and they got my respect. And then, of course, there's Teft with his addiction problems, and the Lopin, and I, I did really like how they ended up uh, becoming Radiance. I do feel like it is... Ah, like there's so many people becoming Radiance that it's starting to not feel as special anymore, but at the same time, I did really like seeing them become Radiance. I just hope that there's not going to be too many more people becoming Knights Radiance, because we got a lot of them. I don't know, I just don't want every character we follow to be Radiant. Oh, and then, of course, Rock at the end, when he uses the shard bow and saves Kaladin. I am so happy he was the one to save Kaladin. Um, but I I was so sad, though, to see, like, how much that affected Rock. But it did get me thinking, how was Rock able to use the shard bow? Because, like, I know he's strong, but still, like, that's that's kind of crazy. I, I think maybe because Rock has a connection to Spren, and a shard bow is actually like a Fabriel, so maybe that connection allowed him to, to use it. I don't know. Now, Kaladin doesn't get as much page time in this book, um, and he's kind of down on himself, you know, as he is. But I love the scene when he returns to Hearthstone, um, and also later on when he joins the, the Wall Guard and forms kind of a Bridge 4 bond with them in Kolinar. And of course, I gotta mention Azure, the High Marshal of the Guard. There is some, some big Cosmere reveals there, which I was not expecting, and it took a while for it to click for me. Same with uh, Zyle, the, the Swordmaster. I won't spoil that if you haven't read other Cosmere books, but you should probably go back to Oathbringer once you do, and keep an eye out for Cosmere mentions. But anyway, back to Kaladin. I feel like a lot of people kind of, um, they get this attachment to Kaladin, like he's kind of the main character to them, and I think that's one reason why a lot of people had some problems with Oathbringer, because he's not in this book as much. Now, when Cal freezes up during the big, the big event when Elokar is killed by Moash, I, I get it. I understand that he went into shock and he froze. It's still just kind of frustrating. He beats himself up all the time about not being able to save everyone, even though he does save, like, a lot of people. But at this moment, it did kind of frustrate me because he so easily could have saved Elokar, and Elokar was in the middle of speaking the first ideal. People freeze and they mess up. It, uh, it just... I just wasn't ready for Elokar to die. But anyway, I still love Cal. I wish we got to see more of him in this book, and same within the fourth book. Now Shallan, seeing her descend further into these multiple personalities, was honestly pretty disturbing. But I also find it so fascinating, but she can kind of be a hard character to read at times. She's gone through a lot, and wants to hide it away like Dalinar did, and it's very worrisome. Now, obviously, I've already read Rhythm of War, so I'm trying to not mix things up that happened in that book, but let me just mention the final battle. Shallan did some crazy illusions on that battlefield. She creates, like, a whole army, and even makes, like, smells and sounds, and creates a monstrosity of an illusion. Her abilities are pretty incredible. There's also the sort of love triangle with Shallan, Adolin, and Kaladin. It's not really a big focus, but I do think it makes sense for Shallan's different personalities to react differently 
friendly and be attracted to different people. But it was also just a pretty small and kind of unnecessary part of the book. I'm just happy it got resolved before going too far and taking up way too much page time because I think Adolin and Shallan are meant to be together anyway. Speaking of Adolin, let's talk about him for a moment. He didn't get a whole lot of page time, but I did enjoy what we did get. I feel like he takes things a little too well with Shallan. It's nice that he's so understanding, but I'd like to see him react in a more human way once in a while and get frustrated or lose his cool. Now it's kind of leading up to Adolin awakening his shard blade, and even though Adolin struggles with not having all these cool radiant powers and feeling kind of inadequate, I like that he isn't a radiant like everyone else. Oh, I should also mention the whole Sadius thing. I feel like it was kind of anticlimactic. I thought because of this, maybe Adolin's relationship with Dalinar or Shallan would kind of struggle or drift apart, but there wasn't really any massive repercussions for what he did. And when he finally tells Shallan, she decides that it was fine because the world was a better place without Sadius. Ah, uh, who else? Um, Zeth and Nightblood, I, okay, I love Zeth and Nightblood. I want to see more of them. I can't wait until we get, like, Zeth's book where we get his flashbacks. So that's about it for the discussion. I'll be posting a review for Rhythm of War next week, and I'll also be working on a spoiler-filled discussion for that book as well. Let me know all your thoughts on Oathbringer down in the comments.